So I'm just going to briefly uh, do quick introductions. This is Deb Vinance, who I believe may be familiar to some. I know uh, Lorraine had said she knows you. Um, and with her are also Carol Shep, am I saying yes, that properly? Yeah. Yes. And Arlie Jones. Um, and they're going to be presenting to us on uh, community care and uh, letting us know more about what is available to our patients in the community. So brief introduction, but I will let them take it right away. I always say, uh, the best things I ever do and ideas come from everybody else. But it's an opportunity to talk about uh, the people we serve and how we as a team, community and tertiary and hospitals, etc., work together differently. And uh, to get prepared for the session, uh, Esther Lita sent some questions that many people had submitted. So we tried to focus on those. But in, I guess what I want to make sure everyone knows is that uh, there's probably going to be more questions and you know I went to websites and talked to colleagues etc but some of the discussions and questions today will help the health authority sort out what kind of information and education do we need to uh, start providing so we understand everything that we're all about we've been introduced I'll keep going and I can be chatty so they're going to sort of keep me on target <laughs> and so uh, so today's talk, the question was, what's an access center and what's a My Health team? And I don't uh, pretend to be uh, an expert in everything, so I brought colleagues who can certainly fill in some of the blanks. And really today is about we, all of us. How can we support patients from those clinically complex, which you see here in tertiary care, whether it be in patients or down in uh, the clinics? Uh, to the stable patients but still have diagnosis but are out in the community. And by working together in a different fashion, integrated teams, and they might uh, include specialists such as uh, Shelley Zeroth, which is one of the reasons, she and Esther Lita, who's another of the specialists, that brought us here today, and primary care, which is family physicians, uh, nurse practitioners, etc., and others. And really, we're here today because of congestive heart failure, but there's a lot of other things that we can work closely on. So, a story. How did exactly did an ICU nurse, me, uh, who was the program director for cardiology, and uh, for those who know me, uh, I might have loved my work a bit, wind up in the community. Well, I remember uh, working uh, with cardiac rehab, refit and wellness, and the passion that folks you know, showed in terms of rehab and all the things they had ideas for. Gee, I thought this is interesting. And then we did a myocardial infarction clinical pathway. And it was across all the hospitals in terms of if you weren't, you know, basically nothing too complicated, what can we do in terms of length of stay? And I remember someone saying, well, Deb, if their length of stay is shortened, we'll need to engage home care in people's homes. I'm scratching my head again. Really? So we did. And I thought, oh, don't know much about home care. Occasionally, you know, if we needed someone to sort of had some, you know, special treatment before a procedure, you know, we used to sort of engage them, but really didn't know much. And then I remember we were doing a fast track chest pain clinic. We had some special funding. And if I arrived in Emerge and had chest pain, we'd get you, get me fast tracked to uh, a cardiologist, so there's no head nodding, some people remember this. And, but one of the things that was a problem is some of these folks didn't have a family physician. So we went out and met with primary care program to make sure these folks were connected with family physicians. And I remember driving back after that meeting and thinking, holy man, there's a lot about the healthcare system that I don't know. The surprise. There is more to healthcare services than what I knew, and you might feel that way sometimes uh, as well. And at that time, it seemed like healthcare system was a series of disconnected parts. There was poor system integration between the hospital, long-term care, community, and primary care service providers. And it was also clear that citizens, whether we call them patients, do we call them clients, residents, we all have a different name, right guys? Uh, would be better served if the healthcare system was truly a system. And I knew I had a lot of learning to do, and that's how I came to work in the community in terms of to learn more about the broader system, and it was a hard leave. So I'm going to talk about access centers, and really everyone knows there's three uh, 
sectors in healthcare. There's acute care here, and certainly I think everyone's aware acute care is changing, depending whether you're, you know, tertiary hospital, Victoria, lots of changes going on. But, you know, I think there's still the hospital sector, the community uh, to care, which is uh, community care actually is health and social services and long-term care. And there's some examples here of long-term care, but there's a lot of services in long-term care. So. So within community health services, uh, there's some that are managed centrally, and there's some that are managed sort of in geographic areas and are managed in the geographic areas. So you're probably familiar with some of these, the respiratory care, people on ventilators that actually have services in their home to make sure they are stable and are managed well and on oxygen. Certainly IV. Uh, people certainly uh, get IV services in their home and there's two IV sites where uh, people actually get services. One is Access Transcona and uh, one is downtown right now but we'll be moving to Misericordia. But it used to be that if you were, uh, had an infection, you used to be in hospital for weeks, which is if I just need a little bit of an IV therapy, didn't make sense. So that was a good move uh, several years ago. There's a stroke program that's managed separately. And I think everyone's aware of palliative care because there's also a palliative care ward here. Now within geographical areas, there's um, I think city boundaries. If you look at where all of you live, you'll have a postal code. That establishes what community area, if you needed a service, you would uh, be linked to. So Winnipeg Integrated Services, hmm. Winnipeg Regional Health Authority Community Services is just one component of Winnipeg Integrated Services. The other part is the Department of Families, and that's social services in Winnipeg. And this started in 2004, and Manitoba Health was also heavily involved in this planning because it was established, maybe we could do better if we work differently together. And uh, also knowing that a lot of folks weren't getting the services that they needed. I think probably you, when you think about some of those complicated patients you're trying to get discharged, you know that there's lots of uh, challenges that people face. And a lot of what is done in the community is focused on determinants of health. And it's probably been years since you've seen this, probably since, you know, uh, education days and uh, university days or college days. But we know that it's not just about clinical health. You know, if I'm poor, and we know the evidence in terms of, I'm not gonna have as good a health. And, you know, employment, you know, a lot of these particular pieces. So it's not just that big thing, health services. So. That's why services are a little different in the community. And one of the key things about this, and I didn't really understand as well as I should have, is all of the services that are in the community that have nothing to do with the health authority or Department of Families. These are just, you know, uh, you know agencies, sometimes they're just citizen groups. They get together, schools, and keep, try to keep uh, citizens well. So as I talked about the postal code thing, uh, we're all sort of fit into uh, geographical areas in the city of Winnipeg. And uh, so this is sort of all the pieces that fit together into paired areas. And I know the map would be better because there's certain streets that tells you what area you're in. And I'm from Kenora, so I really struggle with that. <laughs> So uh, these are the people who manage each of the paired community areas and uh, basically are responsible for all the community services in that particular area. And there's a couple asterisks here. In this area, St. Boniface, St. Fatal, just down the street here, uh, is an access center. And I've, there's two stars because to work there you have to be able to speak French. It's bilingual. So it's one of the sites, no matter where you live, if you require French services, <coughs> that's your spot. And then there's a couple uh, deviations in terms of structure. Uh, I think you're aware that out in uh, St. James of Cinnaboy South, they're affiliated and report through uh, Grace Hospital and Fort Gary River Heights, they're affiliated with and report through uh, the structure at Victoria Hospital. And everywhere else, uh, everyone reports through, you know, the WRHA and also Department of Families. But uh, so those are the uh, folks in terms of if you're ever, you know, okay, we'll call and they'll be able to sort this out. And again, uh, is there an access center in every community? No. Uh, some it's paired. 
and these are a list of access centers and you have to have primary care in terms of family physicians, nurse practitioners, etc., and employment and income assistant to be called an access center. Anything that doesn't have that will be called a health and social services site and there's some of those in Leela and in Portage. So uh, just to explain, oh, do we have an access center? That's really the original definition that has not been revisited maybe since the uh, original planning of integrated services. So these are the key features of Winnipeg Integrated <coughs> Services when all of the senior people in government and the health authority were looking at that is uh, we really focus on an access and it's very complex folks. If I wanted to go and get services in primary care, too healthy. <laughs> too healthy and not complicated. So, and most of our folks or many of our folks are served by many different programs that are part of Winnipeg Integrated Services. And that co-location uh, actually I think has been very beneficial for folks. And uh, who do I report to? I report to uh, a boss at Department of Families and I also report to the COO at the uh, health region. So these are the programs that you'd find at an access center except for the health and social services centers. So primary care, I'm not going to talk much about that because you're going to hear uh, about that with the next presenters. Public health, home care, and we also uh, manage home care in the hospitals, uh, the case coordinators, and home care nursing, community mental health, and that varies across each community area in terms of what services are available in mental health. And something called community development, which I didn't know anything about when I worked in the hospital. But we have community facilitators that work out with community groups to link us together with, uh, for instance, in, in Elmwood, we work at the Elmwood Resource Center. We might work with the uh, parent-child coalitions, etc. But working in terms of uh, making sure that uh, everyone's supported. No wrong doors. So basically if you walk into an access center and we hope that staff will be able to, you might not need no services in the building, but you know I, I kind of you know need some clothes, you know I want to get a job, or is there anywhere I can, you know, is there any food banks, etc. We try to make sure that the staff at the front end, and these are support staff, have information for folks. And certainly because of the type of staff that are in the building, uh, there's information that can be provided and people can just be called because uh, there are a lot of people out there who don't know where to turn for advice and certainly uh, and some people who come to access centers guys they just come there because it's a warm safe place to spend the day and some of these folks uh, may be homeless there's a, an occasional one that and they go somewhere else at the end of the day and but you know it's warm safe and there's a magazine to read and uh, so you know, we never know who's going to walk in the door, but we do know some of these folks have no doors to walk into. And the buildings are in, uh, were actually all built to be very accessible, and I think everyone's aware of the accessibility le legislation that's big right now. Um, the access centers were planned so people who were disabled, you know, could, you know, do things easily there. And we've, I think every access center has won the uh, City Accessibility Awards which is, I think, a compliment to the planners. And it, an access center has to be on a bus route because I'm not necessarily well off and have a car. So, and we do think that uh, we're better because we work together. And certainly the My Health team, you'll get a sense of another key partnership uh, working between uh, the physicians at an access center and then all the fee-for-service physicians in the community. But uh, we also have space in terms of a community kitchen. So. You know, if in fact there's someone who wants to come in and maybe teach you how to uh, cook a different way, geez, there might be a cardiac diet or something, but mostly it's some poor people who want to come together and, you know, maybe make food or else it could be uh, disabled adults who come together. But we do have a community kitchen and it's uh, for the public. And also in the evening, there's a lot of community groups focused on health and social services that can ask to use the building. You just can't charge any do re mi. But you know, it could be Al-Anon, it could be a mental health support group, but run by citizens or, or groups in the community. Because sometimes these things cost money to actually be able to rent a site. And so these are folks that don't report through myself, but we have public health inspectors at some sites. And they do do more than uh, a look at those uh, restaurants. <laughs> and uh, audiology and uh, pediatric speech language and 
We did move some of the uh, speech language for children from some of the hospitals I know, even from St. B, because mm -hmm. families like not to have to go far for their children to actually have a, a patho uh, uh, an assessment, so uh, in the community area. There's wound care clinics at some sites, there's ostomy services at Access uh, Transcona, uh, there's PAC team, which <coughs> is basically uh, uh, very focused on you know services in the home for complex uh, mental health patients, and GPAT, and that was one of the questions you asked about, so I'll, I'll <coughs> there's some information here that's coming. And other services, uh, education, and there's some other packages that are coming. There's lots of education that is available at the Access Centers. I know that we never did too, too much education because sometimes if I'm really struggling in the hospital, sometimes when I'm well is a good time to have education. So these are some samples of what's available and it's not just for people that actually get services at the Access Centre. It can be, come on in folks, we want you to learn about COPD, we want you to learn how about cholesterol and quitting smoking and how to you know, better manage your diabetes and how to better breastfeed. Uh, there's a new one, craving change, in terms of, of weight, etc. But citizens are welcome. This is not sort of we're just closing things off. There's some things that are very specific to some groups, but generally, you know, and, and it's kind of nice if I come out and have a problem and I can connect with other people who have similar challenges as well to talk about my experience with this particular thing. So uh, we try to have a very welcoming. Uh, site for people to come who have chronic diseases and challenges. So benefits, uh, certainly services are very accessible, but we also provide services at uh, other sites, in homes, community agencies, so full range again I said, but basically we believe things are better because uh, if people work together, they generally learn a lot about things and uh, I think that there's good joint planning and uh, in terms of, okay, this is a really complex, uh, what do you think you should do? Because sometimes for those folks who have more than one service, you really have to understand who's doing what. And the opportunity for folks to be together and have those conversations <coughs> regularly. And I know that uh, I've always learned because I'm surrounded by people who have different experiences and are smarter than me. So I think that's the opportunity of, of folks being together. And it's also uh, the opportunity to bring build teams in different ways. And so what are direct operated uh, primary care clinics? Basically, they're part of the primary, uh, broader primary care system and every access center, as I said, have one. And geez, they're part of that My Health team you're going to be hearing about. Oh, and you asked the question, do any of these folks go out to people's homes, like doctors or nurse practitioners or nurses? Yes. <laughs> In answer to your question, they do. And the folks that are there are the most complex. As I said, I'm too well to actually uh, be seen in an access center because we really do want to see folks who really do have complex health issues, but also social services issues as well. A lot of folks who really uh, struggle uh, are the folks that are part of the Access Center uh, uh, primary care group. So these are some of the folks that complexity that are a little different and I didn't know much about before I came out to the community. And those are, you know, if you look at the community health assessments, you know, some folks move around a lot and that instability is sometimes really difficult for them and, and their kids. And poor people, as I said, you know, in terms of, there's struggles in terms of, uh, if you live in poverty. And social housing generally again, uh, for people in social housing generally uh, are not well off. And certainly major uh, mental health diagnosis. We know this is something we haven't talked about and we've instead judged, but guys we all have mental health. I think that's why mindfulness and the Catholic Health Foundation, I think that works out of somewhere around this uh, site, is identifying that there's, uh, we all have mental health and can do a lot uh, better in terms of wellness as well and newcomers, certainly a lot of uh, new uh, people to the country. I think everyone's aware that we've had a, a lot of uh, new people come into the country. I think last year, a lot of people from Syria, and this year certainly the asylum seekers that are coming across the borders. And teen moms and children. We want to make sure that uh, uh, moms who are teenagers are uh, do well during their pregnancy and after, and certainly children in care. So 
wide variety, I guess, of other folks uh, that we do serve. Uh, within public health, there's something called Family First, where we assess uh, someone who just had a baby in terms of, you know, ask a series of questions. And if the mom and the baby, in terms of parenting, et cetera, needs support, they will get it on an ongoing basis. And we certainly, uh, some patients aren't part of our primary care clinic, but a doctor will phone and say, I can't assess Deb because I don't have all of the right equipment, and Deb has a disability, and we'll even do one-time visits if a doctor phones us. But, you know, we have the right uh, equipment to actually, uh, uh, you know, see people who are in wheelchairs or scooters or all the rest of it. And as I said, we do do home visits. And we'll also see folks who, you know, really have struggles, but, uh, and sometimes we'll get a call from the doctor that says, you know, Deb's really, really, you know, really complicated. I think they need, you know, all of those uh, other services that are available at the ex Access Center. Can we transfer Deb to you? And that would be a conversation that is, the usual answer is yes. So, information to the public. Are you guys all aware of the Family Doctor Finder? Good, because that's really important because a lot of people struggle with the who do I call and if uh, people call there and they're the right person for the access center and they live in the area, they will be directed to the right uh, place. And I think you're all familiar with this, so I won't continue. And you asked, and as I said, I was really grateful that there was questions asked in terms of this is things we want to know about. And so I talked to Marlene Graceffo, who looks after uh, sort of rehab services, and because there was questions about, you know, a lot of different things, and she said, this is where you find the information. And Prime is, uh, I think there's a, I did put a handout on Prime around, but there is information on the website about many things. The WRHA website, the public, we want the public to go in and look, okay, what, what's where, and make it easy. And I'm hoping that some of the questions you've asked today, and we'll ask a little later, will also help the WRHA keep this website, uh, I think, for, I think, make it easy for everyone in the whole healthcare system, not just the public, to understand what's going on within health services. So the other question was about the priority home. I think some of you may or may not have heard presentations about this. It's the priority home is something that's being done uh, elsewhere in the country for a long time in terms of it's basically, uh, we believe that I should always be looked at to see if I can go home. And so there's a different conversation that needs to happen in the hospital instead of, oh, personal care home. Uh, and because one of the things we know is if I get some rehab and actually some different types of supports, I'll be fine at home. That's certainly what they found in other provinces. And so uh, I asked a question yesterday at a home care meeting. I said uh, to the managers, how challenging is it when a person's in a, a personal care home and they want to go back to their regular home? Can you imagine the complications with planning that one? Because the key message is people get well when they get the right services. And um, do you feel more comfortable in your own home or some other strange place? And the answer is generally your own home. And I do wonder generationally, if you ask the question of yourself, where you want to be long term? And it's a question I think we all need to reflect on. Do we want to be in a personal care home or do we want to be in a place that is our home? But there's going to be some short-term transitional sort of intense case coordination. It's only going to be for 90 days and then these folks will be transferred back to regular uh, home care. called fast response nursing. <laughs> and uh, so basically these folks will work 12-hour shifts and uh, take referrals generally from the usual sort of way. but there's someone that needs to be seen, you know, it's fairly acute, you know, in terms of they might not get into their doctor right away, but we're a little concerned that, you know, unless they're assessed or seen, this, this might not be a good thing. And also follow-up phone calls. It's, is there still uh, sometimes telephone care that's given in hospitals where people just follow up with patients by telephone? So those sorts of things are also, I think, very helpful. And again, this is a short stay in terms of two to three weeks. And one of the biggest thing is, you'll notice here, is a strong integration with uh, uh, family physicians. So that's all I have to say. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Carolyn uh, Arley. But I think the message is, 
is the healthcare system really is, it's big. And the more we know about the system, uh, the better I think we can serve. So. Well, thank you guys. I was so honored to come because it's an opportunity to hear your questions and to share. Because we're not about us guys, we're about the people we serve. Thanks, Deb. Um, so I'm happy to be here to talk about my health teams. Have, have people heard about my health teams or heard the name? So a few nods may not know um, a lot about it. So um, as Deb said, I'm, I'm Carol Schapp. I work within the primary health care program. I'm an initiative lead uh, within that program. And so one of the initiatives I support across the region uh, is my, my health teams. So I want to start with what is primary care because when I talk to lots of professionals, the public, but lots of professionals, it's not always clear that people understand what primary care is. So primary care is most commonly understood as the first point of contact <coughs> within the health system in the community. So certainly your family physician or nurse practitioner, um, people often think of that. But it's more than that as well. When you go see the pharmacist and ask about the medication for the sore throat or you see the physiotherapist because you've got a sore back or you sprained your ankle, um, or you know you go see the dietitian to talk about your dietary needs or your, your diabetes or whatever out in the community, that's all considered primary care. So primary care is very, fairly, um, fairly broad. So with the province, the province was looking at primary care and then they looked specifically at family physicians and, and primary care clinics in the province uh, a, num a number of years ago and they sort of looked around and said, hmm, we really don't have a system of care for primary care. The reason that is is because 97% of the physicians who work, family physicians who work, do not belong to the health system. They are private individual businesses. They're fee-for-service physicians who run their own clinic in their own way, however they want, and they're not tied to the um, the healthcare system in any way, other than you know some rules around remuneration, and then they're obviously their professional uh, obligations with their colleges and so on. So there really isn't any kind of system, and and we didn't really have a very good relationship with these, and so the um, so the province back in 2010 said, okay, we need to change that, we need to create more of a system. And their first vision from 2010 to 2015 was around family doctor for all. You might have heard that slogan, it was out there and around and that's where trying to connect people with the family physician. They've upgraded their um, primary care renewal vision and so you see this up here now. Um, so you can see uh, the vision is Manitobans will have knowledge of and access to high quality, <coughs> cost effective, primary care. So that's the whole goal is to up the quality and, and uh, effectiveness and cost effectiveness of primary care. And to do that, they've got um, three priority areas. One is access, so we want people to have access to family physicians. So the first thing was family doctor finder to help people who wanted a family doctor to connect to the doctor or nurse practitioner. Um, and so that's one form of access. The sec another form of access is it's great if you have an NP or a, or a physician as your family physician uh, or primary care home. Um, but if I call up and I've got you know an acute illness and I can't get in for four weeks, that's not very helpful either. So access is also about being able to get in quickly when you need the care in the right care. Because if I don't get it, where am I going? Emergency room, urgent care, <laughs> walk-in clinic, so on. So access is very important, it's a key priority. Continuity, and so um, that with primary care home um, and uh, College of Family Physicians, that's really important. Continuity of care over lifetime is a really important principle for them. Lots of research out there that when you have a relationship with the primary care provider that you know over time, your, your care is much better because they know you. So continuity, so that you're not just going from walk-in clinic to walk-in clinic, you, you get a relationship with someone who knows you over time and comprehensive. So we want to have good comprehensive care so um, you know people can get better care within their primary care. Um, when you are transitioning from hospital you'll have confidence they're going back to a primary care home that can support all of their complex needs whether it's cardiac or other chronic diseases um, that come in. And so to achieve these um, priorities there's a few uh, renewal activities that were undertaken. Family Doctor Finder, Quick care clinics, those are undergoing a transition, um, as you know. Um, interprofessional team demonstration initiative and my health teams. 
Interprofessional Team Demonstration Initiative, we call it ITDI for short, it's still a mouthful. Um, it's about putting uh, nurses, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants into fee-for-service primary care clinics full-time. So um, this is across the province. And so we have uh, about 26, 25 of these professionals within fee-for-service clinics within Winnipeg. Um, we have uh, expressions of interest that the clinics have to apply for. They have to meet certain criteria. Um, and then if they are accepted, then they will have, they, they talk about their needs. And so most, most often it's a, a nurse that goes in. And they are embedded in that clinic and work side by side with the uh, physicians and or NPs in that clinic to help improve uh, the quality of care, particularly around chronic diseases and other pieces, so they can work to full scope and assist that assist that clinic. What we're going to talk about more today is the My Health team. So we will um, just move on from there. So My Health teams um, are based are on creating networks of physicians working and NPs working together. Okay, so they're a formalized partnership between multiple fee-for-service clinics and access centers and other community health agencies to work together, and it's a legal agreement between um, the government and them and their, the other partners. So they form a partnership. Now, why would they do this? Well, they do it for a few reasons because there's some goodies that'll come their way if they do that. So if they sign up, um, and become um, this uh, my my health team, then the the government will give them mental health will give them money, and a, a, a initially a significant sum of money, five hundred and seventy five thousand dollars, for them to hire interprofessional team members to come and be a part of their network and service the needs of their clinics and um, patients. Okay, so they get these um, interprofessional team members, chronic disease clinicians, nurses, OTs, social workers, we'll hear more about that as we go along. So they have help coming in because we know physicians and MPs on their own in primary care can't do it all for everyone. And chronic disease is often is a place, cardiac and otherwise, where we're not meeting to the standards and so on because there's so many other things going on. So they need interprofessional team members to help support the care to give them better comprehensive global uh, care in the system. So these are service physicians to come together and create a bit of a system, okay? So they don't, the government's just not handing them the money, there's deliverables that they have to give in, in return. So if they sign up and get the money and they hire these um, uh, people, the interprofessional team, and, and um, I should clarify, one of the big differences with my health teams is that it is physician run, fee for service, physician run. It isn't the health system telling them what to do or how to do it or what to build. We administer it. We administer the funds and we administer the interprofessional team members that go in there. There are staff, but the fee-for-service physicians as a group make all the decisions around it. We just don't go in and tell them what we think. They have to look at their patient populations and they have to make submissions that Manitoba Health agrees to, but they are the decision makers, not us. But in return, um, they, they have to provide enhanced access to primary care. So each My Health team, um, there's six of them, each My Health team in Winnipeg, each My Health team has to, had to attach 2,000 new patients to their network. So they have to be attaching new people. And they have to be working on getting access into their clinics within 24, 48 hours, excuse me, for acute care issues. So if you have an acute issue, then they're working towards having access to their clinics within 24 to 48 hours. They also have a deliverable around they have to support patients with complex needs and they have to give plans about how they are going to do that and most often they use their interprofessional teams to help them with that. And then um, the third one that's come up this year, so this they kind of, each year there's a new deliverable that comes out. The new deliverable is outreach to underserved populations. So they'll get more money to hire more staff, interprofessional staff, if they have a plan on outreach to underserved populations, and then they have to demonstrate over time that they're doing that. And there will be probably a few more deliverables as time, time goes on with them. So it's about creating a system of physicians and MPs working together that are fee for service with also our system physicians at our access centers and our community health agencies, bringing them together with um, 
interprofessional teams to provide better care for patients out there. So why don't I turn it over to Arlie to tell you more about them. Thanks, Carol. Um, so as mentioned already, there are six My Health teams in Winnipeg, and I manage two of them. Um, so I won't go in too much into this graph because Deb had a nice graph looking very similar. Um, but what we do is we look at enhancing patient care through physician support, just like Carol identified. So it really is physician-led, and it's identifying um, priority populations and gaps in service in the paired community areas where the physicians feel that they could provide, or they could potentially benefit from more support, and their patients could benefit from more support. So it could be CP COPD, it could be diabetes. Um, we have an interesting partnership starting up with CHF Clinic here in River East Transcona, looking at um, cardiac disease, specifically CHF. So really, it's networking and knowledge sharing, and that is sometimes the knowledge, and oftentimes the knowledge is in the specialty. But how do we then uh, support capacity building within specialties such as CHF clinic so you can see more patients? How we do that, we envision, is being able to impart that knowledge and that expertise and be able to allow for physicians in the community, nurse practitioners in the community, and chronic disease clinicians in our community areas to deliver that kind of chronic disease management through the support and the expertise, of course, of the ex uh, the specialties in um, in this case CHF I'm talking about we but we have numerous examples of um, COPD management and partnering with the pulmonary rehab program um, Cody case management and uh, partnering with mental health so after hour and um, on-call coverage as Carol mentioned one of the deliverables of uh, my health teams is access to care in 24 to 48 hours so that is going to be tackled by physicians really working together and covering each other off and being able to provide support. Um, and for patients, as there's changes happening in our healthcare system, and you're right in the midst of it now, um, the consolidation with the hospitals and the changes in emergency rooms to urgent care, we're going to need to look in our community areas more closely at what after hours and extended hours looks like. And, and that's where my health team can be helpful. And then, as I mentioned already, capacity building. So some of the areas that the different communities have been working on are chronic pain, COPD, um, CODI mental health is one, um, and CHF. So this just gives an example of some of the um, clinical services that, again, when, we, when Carol <coughs> talked about the money that is offered to a My Health team, they then put a proposal together via the My Health team manager, which, is, which I'm one of those people, um, that goes to Manitoba Health to get approved for funding for these different positions. So we have um, chronic disease clinicians, which work in um, managing chronic disease in various um, ways. So again, diabetes, COPD, CHF, cardiac disease. We also have occupational therapists, physiotherapists, um, just starting to do some partnership with mental health and mental health counselors. Um, in downtown Point Douglas, we're doing an interesting collaboration with Manitoba Families and EIA in income security health promotion, which is um, basically saying that, you know, you can't really address chronic disease if you're not addressing all the complexities that people living in a vulnerable population are dealing with. Um, and then pharmacists, uh, nurses, nurses, dietitians, and again, the Cody case manager. What's Cody? Yeah. Yeah. Cody. That's Cody, okay, so that's a good question. Um, it's all, it, part of my team, so I just feel like I, I should, everyone knows this. Um, it's co-occurring disorders, so it's uh, mental health and addictions. And it used to be and is still a very specialized program within mental health, located at a health sciences center. And what we really felt was we could build capacity in physicians with com being comfortable in managing people and either titrating off of um, benzodiazepines or working towards titration off of opioids and supporting patients in the community in that kind of uh, management of addictions and mental health. Thanks, Carol. Okay. Um, so then again, I'm talking about chronic disease management and prevention group education. So we have done a lot of education around COPD in, in many of our areas. And again, that's kind of where we started in a lot uh, of different areas was focusing on that. So we have um, commit to quit smoking cessation classes. We have COPD essentials. When you have a new diagnosis of COPD, you and your family can come out um, and get some basic education and then links to further resources. Um, we also link with the complex diabetes care team. 
Um, we're working on transitions from hospitals again. So if you're coming home from hospital and you're you're working in an acute care setting like you are and you're saying like what are, what is my patient going out into um, that there is this network of support now that you can feel more confident um, that the patient care needs will be met um, collaboration with mental health and with home care um, before we go to questions I just wanted to highlight that we are starting in River East um, Transcona a partnership with CHF clinic and one of the priority populations of River East Transcona that the physicians identified was cardiac disease management and specifically CHF management in their patient population. We also looked at the um, number one diagnosis of admission or presentation to hospital in our community area, and that was CHF. So um, in the same time, Shelley and Esther Lita had reached out to us to um, say, how do we build our capacity and help flow through our CHF clinic? So it seemed like a natural partnership. So we've hired a chronic disease management clinician nurse who will be starting in two weeks with us, spending some time shadowing here in CHF clinic and have opportunity to um, work with and understand the nurse um, managed algorithms uh, that, that um, they're using here in CHF clinic to help manage um, CHF in the community and hopefully build the confidence um, and the capacity within our My Health team and spread that um, to other community areas as well. So questions for any one of us. And I, I just mm -hmm. wanted to mention maybe before the questions that um, this is to join a volunteer, uh, join a my health team from a physician point of view is voluntary. Yes. No one's forced to do this. They have to want to do this and agree to come on board. So we have approximately 40% of the physicians within Winnipeg have now signed up. Um, our goal, you know, goal in Manitoba Health School, of course, is get to 60 to 80 and, and so on and entice people uh, into this. So each My Health team that represents, roughly speaking, around 30,000 patients. So if you multiply that by, by six, that's kind of the, the reach of the My Health team right now. But. Are care clinic health care record are accessible to family doctors? Do they use same EPR? Like how they are charged? Um, so within the clinics that are sort of owned and operated by the region, so the Access Center and some of our funded partners, so we fund community health agencies, so community health agencies are places like Clinic with the K, Mount Carmel, Aboriginal Health and Wellness, so out of the, the ones that are funded by the WRHA, which is, you know, two or three percent of everybody. Um, we share a common EMR, so in, in the community we call it EMR, electronic medical record, you call it EPR. So we share a common and so the patients are common but there's, there's obviously divides, you know, to keep privacy. But 97% of the rest in the rest of the community, private fee for service. Um, in, across Manitoba, 80% of physicians uh, in private practice or in practice uh, have EMRs now. So that's a huge sea change from a few years ago. So 80% have them, but they're, they can be different. They just have to meet this standard with um, Manitoba Health. So there's there's two or three that are commonly used, but there's four or five different vendors of EMRs um, that people have. So they do not speak to each other, which is uh, one of the big issues. And EMR speaking to EPRs and other parts of the system is also a problem. Oh, repeat the question. So um, the question is, um, the, the physicians are making the decision on who to hire, but, but the people who are hired, are they um, WRHA staff or the, who are they? Yes, they are WRHA staff. They are managed by the, the My Health Team manager, so each, each My Health Team has one. Um, and they are our employees. Um, but the decision making around that comes from the physician, so it's a very different model. The ITDI is the same. They, they're embedded in the, they work full time in that one doctor's office, but they are our employees. ITDI, people are embedded. My health team, we have interprofessional practitioners, but they're shared amongst a group. So ITDI, it's one on one within a clinic. They stay 100% in the clinic. My health team, the interprofessional providers are shared across the group. And oftentimes they're they're located at a hub site, and the hub site's often um, an access center or WRHA site. Um, but at times, depending on the um, amount of space that's in a fee for service clinic, they can also work both in the fee for service clinic and see patients in the hub site. And very very often we do home visits as well. There's a question. Question about the kit. No. Charge. 
No. The question is, is there a fee for commit to quit? And the answer is no. Uh, yeah, I'm, you might be thinking of some other programs. Uh, that, yeah, that's a different, yeah, that's a different. So this is a new commit. Um, it's been a little while. Yeah, two I years. would say two years. Yeah. And um, it's six sessions, five sessions now. It started out as six sessions. Um, when there was some funding, there was NRT available, but there isn't anymore. Um, so it's, there is no charge at all. You're, you're thinking Wellness Institute had kick butt? Was oh. the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so I think that's still going on for people who are interested in that as well. But um, every community area has a commit to quit now. Yeah. So there's no reason that people can't be accessing those. Yeah. The COPD 101, and that's sort of the families and you know, individuals can come and hear about COPD, not about you know, all the complicated things, but just as sort of like a university 101. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, gee, what if there was a CHF 101? What if there was you know, a variety of different 101s related to cardiac disease? Because certainly, I remember one of the things that before, uh, when we were just transferring a lot of the cardiac services here uh, to have a centralized cardiac program, we, we did a bit of an audit in terms of what were the key diagnoses, why people were in hospital. Top two guys, CHF, COPD. And if you look, there's probably still a lot of related to cardiovascular. So you wonder if the 101 sort of thought and idea, if there could be something developed that's just, okay, families, come on in. It's like University 101. You get to find out more about this disease, you know, in a comfortable place with, with folks who also have questions. So I think that something like that could catch on. So. Uh, because I know that the specialty in cardiac diseases might be located here, uh, there might be opportunities. So hold that thought. <laughs> so that, yeah, so self-management, obviously chronic disease management, all, that was the first thing that all of the six My Health teams identified as needing support in. So they have cron chronic disease uh, managers. And so that's the idea, self-management's important. And I think you're gonna, we're gonna see that. I mean, it started, COPD was out of the gate, but all the cardiac pieces will be coming and they will start to work together to develop some community-based yeah. resourcing for um, for these people for sure. And we have diabetes education classes that are very basic too. Yeah. So can a person that's not a, a client or a patient at River East, so they're not accessing all of your services, that's not their primary care. I have a different primary care provider. How do they link in with or can they we can with and access some of these classes and, uh, and other services. I mean, I'm a transcona gal and I have zero idea what goes on in that access center. I only know that I'm not eligible to go there. So for the, for the group classes, classes we, we make them open for everyone, and we're trying to get advertising out into um, clinician, like clinics, so okay. clinics in the area, plus the transcona biz we're trying to advertise in now too and get into health fairs. Um, so if you're not a patient of an access center or a, or a My Health Team signed on clinic, mm -hmm. you can still access the group classes. The only thing you can't access is the one-on-one -on -one clinician work. Yeah, I just haven't yeah. seen them out there in your face, yeah. kind of being advertised, being aware. I, like if somebody had asked me, you know, mm -hmm. where can I access whatever or get information, yeah. In this area that I live in, I would yeah. yeah. I think there is a thing passing around about group education classes, yes. sort of a listing. That's that's just got getting off the ground, and that I think is going to be one of those central pieces that will then it's being trialed that will then spread out the like information. Excellent work and yeah. excellent opportunities, yeah. but if the people that require mm -hmm. the services and the yeah. community yeah. aren't aware of them, yeah, yeah. absolutely. We We're counting on you all. <laughs> yeah. And, and if there are suggestions about where else we can advertise, because we think about, okay, so can, we do Transcona Biz, we do um, clinics in the area, access centers, um, pharmacies, different areas, like um, health fairs when they're held at the um, Kildonan Place, for example. But again, if there's other ideas of where we can yeah. advertise more broadly, that's always the, welcome. The longer term plan is to use that kind of thing um, and, and place it on websites available mm -hmm. to the public. Ideally, the public can then sign up on the website themselves. That's the long range planning, but there's many hurdles to go through. I think if there is even a link or a website, because right now when we have outpatient education to go home, sometimes like, here's a DVD, here's a link to this, 
Yeah. But here's a link to everything that yeah. we'll maybe able to access. Like, yeah, that's that's what we're working towards. It's it's not available right right now, but that's what we're working towards. Yeah. And it is only the kinds of things that we're involved with. Yeah. I mean, there's 10,000 other kind of classes and so on out in the community. So community is very complex and it's mm -hmm. ever changing. Mm -hmm. And it would be like 20 people's full-time job to keep a resource thing up to date on that. Yeah. So, so that is the challenges in community. There is 211 uh, is the go-to phone line for that. Um, and there's yeah. a health services directory online that lists hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of services. So that's another place to, to look. The United Way guys uh, worked uh, closely and they were the leadership in terms of the 211 number. So I think that uh, kudos for United Way. So what is it? What is it? Like you health call for anything. <laughs> health and social services, information, navigation. Do you speak to someone or is it information like press one and one It's, I don't, you know, it's like 311, yeah. only very focused. Um, they were getting a, web, I a think website. There's also a website. Yeah. yeah, I think there's also a website yeah. for mm -hmm. that. What we might be able to do is provide the links to the websites for yeah. that and the health services directory on top of that um, mm -hmm. to add to this presentation if yes. you're going to be sending it out. Yeah. So who do we, yeah, let us know in terms of, yeah, yeah. make sure we have your information because one of the things that, as I said at the start, we wanted to know is uh, we think everyone knows about a lot of things, duh, uh, clearly we have folks don't, but it's really hard to get the word out. So we always appreciate ideas and also uh, if you're working with uh, a patient, what you say matters because they listen to the people who provide service and, and have a relationship with them. So this is why this is uh, such an important discussion today. Priority home? That's <laughs> Close it up. 65 and older only. So what happens if you're in your 50s and you've had a massive stroke and you want to go home? Like, is it just what That's a stroke have? program it's would not, certainly help with that. It's not 65 and, and yeah. over. Is that what it says on there? That's prime. Prime. That's prime. Oh, prime. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Prime. yeah. Priority prime. home is for anyone that requires home care service. Yeah. 65 and older. Yeah. But, you know, it's... It's interesting because we often ask the questions and, and the question is a reasonable one. Will some of this be reviewed? Because of sometimes uh, people's health statuses, I might be 50 going on 80 because of that. Yeah. 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 30s, they're having a mice, so by the time they're 50, they're full down mice. We will, uh, we will keep bringing that forward because we don't disagree. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, certainly the my health teams when we've been asking because we're in a process of planning right now, where they see the gaps. Fifty to sixty-five has been identified as as a huge area. Yeah, we don't have solutions yet, but but yeah, because a lot of things kick in at sixty-five. Yeah. But there's that fifty to sixty-five place. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much um, for presenting to us, and thank you everyone who attended uh, Cardiac Sciences Nursing Grand Rounds.